Good afternoon, everyone. Once again, welcome to uh, the Contemporary China Speaker Series with the Paulson Institute and co-sponsored by the Harris School of Public Policy. Uh, this, is it. this is our final one of the year. And I was just reflecting on uh, what we've done over the last five, uh, five years. We started this whole series uh, back in 2014. And uh, I think we've had uh, something like 40 or 45 speakers come through in, in the last five years. We've had really the who's who in the China field everyone from DC policymakers to renowned journalists uh, to, uh, to even rapper economists and, and social, uh, social media stars, including uh, rising young, uh, young scholars. And you can actually access all of that under the uh, Paulson Institute YouTube channel, just to give a quick plug uh, of the last five years of our, of our, of our talks. Uh, and I am delighted today to actually welcome one of uh, the young rising scholar uh, to our final talk of the year. Uh, Maria Repnikova, uh, you have her bio, so I'm not going to rehash all the details. Uh, the only thing I'll say that's not in the bio is that she and I actually uh, have something in common. We went to the same high school in South Burlington, high school, uh, in South Burlington Vermont, way back when. And uh, she then went off and became a Rhodes Scholar, and I worked at McDonald's. And somehow we ended up uh, back in the same field somehow. Uh, and uh, she's, she's here to talk about uh, her actually award-winning book that just got, got the Book of the Year Award uh, from the International uh, Journal of Press and po Politics. It's Media Politics in China. It really talks about the contentious relationship that journalists have uh, with the Chinese government, but also it's a lot more co uh, you know, complicated and nuanced. And I'll just say one thing to preview that she's also working on a new project that looks at Chinese soft power efforts in Africa. But today she's going to talk about domestic media and, and, ha and how Chinese journalists negotiate with the state. So without further ado, Maria. So good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here and an honor to be the last speaker of this series to share some of the arguments made in this book. Uh, and hopefully to raise more questions during the Q&A about comparisons between China and Russia in this realm, but also about China's global image branding. That's something that I'm working on currently. So if you have more external related foreign policy questions about Chinese media, we can talk more about that also in the Q&A. So, but today I'm going to introduce briefly um, the main arguments and illustrate them with examples from the C period and the Huwen period that was the core um, subject of the study. And then hopefully we'll have more questions. So to start with, the popular image of Chinese media tends to be that of a loyal uh, servant of the party state that's really indoctrinated and pushed to practice propaganda function, as you see here rolling out the red carpet of the Belt and Road Initiative most recently. Uh, it's being limited by multifaceted censorship, the kind of the orchestra metaphor, and at times even controlled through coercive acts. That's something we see a lot, of course, through Western media reporting. That's the general imagery of Chinese media is, is really functioning in one of the world's most difficult environments when it comes to press freedom. As you see, of course, in black, it's, it's marked as having very serious situation when it comes to media freedom. So that's something that it's very known, I think, to anybody observing China. But when we think about the voices that tend to go against that system, the, the voices of dissidents tend to come to mind. They tend to really dominate the headlines. So of course, uh, someone like Ai Weiwei, the very famous Chinese artist, really saying no to the system uh, and his dramatic acts uh, that have been you know, manifested in different types of his artwork as well, really ga capture the, the media uh, headlines. But what exists sort of in between this dichotomy of the omnipowerful state and this very few radical dissident voices is a practice that I discuss in the book called critical journalism, which includes investigative, in-depth, and editorial coverage of contentious societal issues. So in this picture, you just see some examples of those issues from environmental degradation to fake food crisis. You know, food, food safety has been a big issue in Chinese society and Chinese media coverage to man-made disasters like the explosion in Tianjin and many other cases that Chinese public is actually quite concerned about. That's what this critical journalism tends to address. So the platforms where it has functioned over the past decades, arguably, are primarily commercialized news outlets. As you know, Chinese media is not homogenous. There are many outlets that are commercialized, the 49% ownership by private sector. But the state always dominates, of course, the ownership model. So Caixin, Caixin, and the likes are the outlets that tend to be 
in that category. We also see some investigative reporting within state media, and those tend to be sometimes internal, Natan, where they're just being upwards, kind of channeled upwards to the party officials without reaching the public. But nonetheless, there are investigations being done within those outlets. There are freelance journalists. And most recently, we see a fusion of offline and online reporting at platforms like Pengpai, out of Shanghai. Some of you may be familiar with that. And Tencent and Sohu, they have in-depth reporting teams that also work um, to publish some of these more contentious stories. So the overarching questions that this book tries to answer is more broadly, how does resistance on the margins work in China, right? Because journalists are just one type of actor, but they're very intertwined with others, including you know, NGO workers, uh, feminist activists, and so forth. So what can we kind of say about this movement through the lens of journalists? And more specifically, why does the party state that's so suspicious of liberal media and investigative reporting, why would it tolerate some of this type of journalism over the decades? And what motivates journalists to take the risk to embark on this endeavor, to pick this this kind of profession and to continue to persevere in some cases for decades in this work. How do the two actors manage their delicate relationship? The approach that I take is a bit different from other uh, studies that tend to focus on either the government or the journalists or contentious actors. I try to combine the, uh, the two by grasping the interaction, both the top-down perspectives and the bottom-up perspectives of journalists, and engage with both their routine interactions on a day-to-day basis, but also how the terrain that binds them shifts during major crisis events like the Wenchuan earthquake or the repetitive coal mining disasters. So how does that kind of pressure alter or doesn't alter the relationship? And lastly, there's a comparative element to the book which engages with Russia and the Soviet Union and the role of critical journalists in those political systems and who and see, you know, what is different, what's the same between those two regimes? Uh, what sort of continuities and distinctions can we map out based on that comparison? So the empirical approach is very much grounded in extensive field work. There are about 120 in-depth interviews that have been done uh, by me, collected on the ground, primarily in Beijing, but interviewing journalists from different outlets, primarily uh, coming out of Guangzhou, but have offices in Beijing. Uh, a lot of textual analysis as well of official discourses and the articles themselves, trying to understand how investigative articles are written and framed in Chinese media. And lastly, participant observations of conferences and events that have to do with media. There are media ethics events, investigative journalism conferences. Unfortunately, some of them have have shrunk uh, in the past years and no longer take place, but they took place annually for quite a long time when I was doing my research. So the key arguments that I make in this book is that rather than seeing this relationship between journalists and the party state as that of collision, it's rather more of a fluid partnership where the two sets of actors, the central party state and the critical journalists, are united together by a shared objective of upgrading or improving governance. They're, they're both interested in some form of governmental improvement in a very loose sense of that word. But the way the relationship works and gets maintained is through constant acts of improvisation. I call it guarded improvisation or ad hoc adjustments made by journalists and officials as they go along and readjust and maintain that very complex relationship. So I'm going to explain each part of this argument from collaboration to improvisation and um, end it there. But starting with collaboration, what we see is the party state granting journalists an ambiguous consultative role within the system and journalists allying their agenda to that of the central state, again, not the local state, which is a very big distinction that I, that I outline. So what do we see in this kind of uh, collaborative mode from the state side is that their policies alongside with media propaganda, right, guidance of public opinion, is supervision through public opinion, this notion that media can help supervise governance by highlighting public grievances, especially at the local level, and kind of mobilizing those grievances to be seen by the state and therefore corrected and fixed before there's a larger public outrage or crisis. So kind of serving as a, an accountability channel, one of many that uh, the state uses, or at least used to use up until recently. So what we see here is the key term coming up is the constructive role of the media. So it, the critique has to be constructive, which means that journalists are not supposed to criticize for the sake of critique. They're supposed to provide solutions. So when you read the reports, you actually see that there are solutions included in many articles. At the end of the article, sometimes at the beginning, sometimes citing official you know, correspondence, sometimes coming up with solutions themselves as if they're experts in this field. So constructive critique is a very, very different form of journalism, which puts a lot of pressure on journalists, even though it gives them some form of opportunity, but very different from the Western watchdog model, where you're supposed to solely reveal the faults, but not worry about solutions, which is something that Chinese journalists are endowed with as their function. 
What do journalists think about their role in the system where I call them change makers within the system because for the most part they align themselves as actors that work on the margins of that system. They never come out of those margins until they decide to fully exit uh, the entire political space and become dissidents. As one of the intellectuals who organized this investigative journalism conferences over and over told me, I don't want to be a dissident critiquing China from afar, I want to contribute to gradual change from within. So this, this comment is important because if you become a dissident, you become cut off from the entire spectrum of politics in China. You become a voice that echoes you know, dramatic critique, but you cannot be engaged in the process itself. So many people are very reluctant to leave that within the system space, and journalists are those types of actors that stay within. And their disposition is reflected in two things. First, they do provide solutions for the most part. And they talk about this notion that Chinese system needs solutions. You shouldn't just reveal things for the sake of revealing them. Tsai-Sin's editor, Hu Shulik, has made that point many, many times. And in fact, when she was invited to talks in Western universities, the audience was often disappointed. They wanted to see a dissident on stage talking about the future of Chinese journalism. But she simply talked about a very constructive, subtle, and sometimes conservative critique that the media provided. So it was a very different vision from what some of the viewers, the audience, is craved for when they met her for the first time. That she's very much the leader in that field. The second element here is that most reports only focus on local level failures. I mean, for the most part, until recently with the anti-corruption campaign, where some journalists, according to their own words, were invited to help, so to speak, by revealing huge corruption controversies further, they really focus on sub-provincial level issues. So no top level issues, no top officials will be targeted in those reports. And if you read you know, very close to the articles themselves, the higher you go up in the ladder of responsibility, the more diffused it becomes. So it's very hard to tell who's responsible the higher you go up in the actual ladder of political system. So the most common blame is placed on managers, for example, of mines, or local officials who are involved in managing those enterprises. But most of the time, private actors that are somehow you know, guilty in, in, in sabotaging the otherwise good governance that's taking place. So it's very hard to find something that really targets and investigates the entirety of the system. So up until now, you might think this is a very perfect picture of just the two actors you know, working together. But of course, it's not the case. The relationship is very tense because there are many disagreements about what governance improvement, improvement really means and which issues should be tackled in what manner. So as a result, we see so much ad hoc adjustments uh, from journalists and officials. So to start with officials, uh, the first degree of ambiguity here is that the policy of media supervision, Yulun Diandu, is a discourse level policy. There is no law that protects journalists in case they get in trouble. Many activists have pushed for a press law over and over, but never succeeded in getting the press law in place. So essentially, it's a language policy, which means that every time a, a leader makes a speech, all the officials and experts and scholars, including myself, are looking you know, with trepidation to see which words are, are, are coming out on that speech. Is that word still there, or have they changed the, the phrasing? And if they change the phrasing, it's a signal that something is shifting. The thinking about this is shifting. So to give you an example from the Xi Jinping period in his 19th party speech, which was very long, as you know, he did make quite a few references to Yulun Jiandu, but very little when it comes to the media. He talked about other sectors, other you know, civil society more broadly, but the media itself was not referenced as much in that speech. Uh, when it comes to media supervision. So you start wondering, is it shrinking? You know, is the policy shifting based on the speech that he has made and the way he used that term? But because it is a discourse level policy, the adjustment is very much feasible. Whenever you choose to change your mind and have a new policy, you can simply change your discourse. You don't have to worry about the legislation because it's not there. So that's the first level of ambiguity. But most of the ambiguity takes place at the level of restrictions, how to regulate the media coverage itself. So according to my uh, investigation of this issue, about 50% of articles never make it into print. These are the articles written by the journalists I spoke to, which means that a lot of the restriction is preemptive. So they're somewhere in the field investigating a story. They get a text message or a WeChat message, most likely these days, telling them to go back to their desk and abandon the story altogether. So what does this mean? It means that the decision is made before the story even comes out. There's a lot of improvisation with those uh, restrictions. But when you look at the stories and talk to journalists, you see some trends in how this improvisation works. The response tends to be to two things. The first is how popular is a social, certain issue on social media. If everybody's discussing it on Weibo and WeChat, it becomes sensitive automatically, regardless of the content. So even if it's a very local level village you know, protest, a tiny fraction of society is participating in it, but everybody's interested in discussing it online, there's a concern it might spill over to something bigger. And a journalist who is supposed to be the watchdog actually ends up being inhibited and incapable of investigating the story. So there's this irony where social media is, on one hand, as I'll talk about further, empowers journalists, but also disempowers them when it comes to more uh, intensive censorship being applied to the stories that they cover or don't get to cover. The second element of response is to local level pressures. 
So as I mentioned, the relationship is more collaborative with central level officials, but not with local level officials, because they're the target of the investigation. So what you see here is that local level officials find very skillful ways to pressure and to co-opt the journalists, from bribing them you know, to all sorts of accusations of corruption. For example, one story I heard was about journalists waking up at the site of their investigation and finding a red envelope right behind their door. And as soon as they opened the door, there was already police awaiting them and essentially arresting them on account of corruption. So clearly, there was a corruption kind of implanted there. There were bribes that were sort of manufactured. But journalists were prohibited from investigating that story for about a week until they got freed um, based on public pressure. So basically, there are all sorts of ways to inhibit on their coverage, including following journalists uh, on a train from a locale far away from Beijing all the way to the capital. One journalist told me about an official staring him down on the train, just looking at him intensely, trying to convince them to not publish a story. So there's different ways of pressures. But if they have the right relationships and networks, the right kind of guanxi with the upwards officials, then they can find a way to basically issue a censorship ban. So oftentimes, the ban comes from local initiative, comes from local pressures and local pers concerns with social stability. So that's the kind of local level pressure that's at stake here in influencing this very improvised uh, restriction. And this is not to say that there is no post factum control, right? Things are being deleted left and right as well, in particular because of the internet. Journalists I spoke to talk about the 24 hour work cycle, that they can get a message anytime during the night, in the morning. They have to work nonstop because the messages keep coming on how to alter the content. A certain phrase, a title, a certain idea may or may not be adjusted. But the, the point is that the adjustment space is there, and there are tools available now to make it pretty much a 24 hour um, endeavor. And lastly, the response to media re reports themselves is also quite ad hoc. So what you see is an immediate reaction, but a very um, ambivalent response in the long term. So just to give you an example of the Wenchuan earthquake, the immediate reaction to investigations about the schools that collapsed and killed over 5,000 kids was that we need to rebuild the schools. There was a huge campaign, as many of you know, to rebuild them, to advertise the new schools, to showcase that everything is fine. You know, the, this, the province is functioning as usual and even better than before. But if you ask about preemptive measures to basically preempt new earthquakes from destroying more schools, or if you ask about, ask, ask about safety standards for public construction more broadly, those questions have not been answered. And actually, nobody went to jail as a result of the investigations. The more years have passed, the longer time has, you know, this, this issue has been out of the media coverage, the more sensitive it has become. So it's actually harder to investigate the post factum, which one earthquake um, sort of governance, uh, the more time has passed. So it's becoming more sensitive, not less sensitive over time. So it's very difficult to tackle policy reaction or response once it's already been issued. So essentially, there's an immediate responsiveness, which, why, which is why I think Chinese regime has often been re kind of described as a responsive authoritarian state. But we have to look at both the short-term and the long-term reactions. And the long-term reactions are often more mixed, less precise than the short-term response. So what do journalists do in this case, you know, when there are so many fluid restrictions? They try to play around with the space that they have. So it's not a big space, but they have a lot of tools that they deploy to survive in it. So first is the notion of reinterpreting official discourse, or what I refer to as discourse strategy, using official terms to push the boundaries. So this is a banner of an investigative journalism, Yulun Jiandu conference that took place in Hangzhou years ago. But the important thing here is that they use the term Yulun Jiandu to organize the conference, to showcase that they are aligned with official values, official norms, by using their language. If you use the official language, you look as if you're at least acting within that space uh, rightfully and morally. You're not trying to do something egregious or dramatic. But once you enter the conference space, you find many different discussions taking place. For instance, one of the most sensitive ones was about the role of the media in the collapse of the Soviet Union which, of course, was a quite a fundamental role that the Chinese Communist Party is actually studying. But this took place off the record you know, in the evening outside of this official banner site. So using the language to organize something, but then, of course, deploying different tools to discuss things in your own words and even discuss different topics that are not covered by this conference. Most recently, what we see with Peng Pai, the Shanghai-based media outlet, is that they're not using this term because it's not as popular anymore. But they're using the term Meiti uh, Ronghe, kind of media digitalization, right? This idea, the policy to bring all media online and make a creative media campaign. So Peng Pai is at the heart of this uh, campaign. And it's arguing that they're doing a great job. They're attracting readers. But actually, many of their stories are not propaganda stories. They're also quite critical, or at least alternative, of the state's narrative. So, But they're using that term Meiti Ronghe to justify their existence, to justify why they're there and why they should should remain there uh, for the long-term future. So in addition to the discourse strategy, there are many tools that journalists use to negotiate the political pressures themselves. 
So when it comes to preemptive measures, uh, one of the most prominent tools that remained actually active over time is that of extraterritorial supervision. EBDN do, I think many of you may have heard of this term. It applies not only to journalists, but actually to lawyers as well. But it's very specific to China. You don't see this practiced in Russia, for instance, or other quite large, fairly decentralized systems. The notion is that the journalist from one city uh, goes to another to investigate officials in a different jurisdiction to avoid local level pressures. So somebody in Pangpai, in Shanghai, would go to Guangzhou, to go to Beijing. Somebody in Nanfang Zhongmo would go to Harbin or something. And they would move around like this in this you know, wonderful mosaic, investigating one another, but not investigating their own local officials. So if you go on the website of Pangpai, you'll see smiling Shanghai officials doing great things uh, for Shanghai. But then if you scroll down, you'll see stories about other officials in other locales that are not doing such great things. They're actually you know, struggling with governance, or they might be corrupt. So that's the kind of strategy of bypassing local level pressures. Uh, this is very, still very prominent when I asked uh, journalists about this on my last visit last year. They smiled at me and said, if not for EDD and do, what else do we have? It's kind of our main core, you know, sort of defensive um, mechanism. But other than that, there's quite a bit of networking and collaboration across jurisdictions as well. Unlike, for, for instance, the US or Europe, where journalists compete with each other, there's kind of a head-to-head -head competition. In China, because of censorship, there's quite a bit of cooperation between journalists in one locale and the other. I personally witnessed many occasions when there were people waiting in line to see famous journalists with their stories and files of you know, governance failures from local officials or they were you know, unemployed or so forth. And the journalist just waved them away and said, I can't take the story, but please call this number. And my friend might be able to do it. So they're sharing the stories across different networks. It's not just across regional networks, it's across media networks as well. And lastly, deploying social media to their advantage, right? Just because officials are watching Weibo or WeChat doesn't mean the journalists aren't better at it. They're much more savvy, they're younger. So oftentimes they're quicker to get the story. They're much faster to cover something exciting and they can outrun the censors. In the worst case, they can also wait out censorship, which means that they wait until the story passes and publish it later as a kind of a collective set of stories or a long magazine article. So there's no expiration date on censorship, as journalists would tell you, but they do tend to fade out over time because new stories come and play. So you can kind of wait out the immediate reaction and publish something longer but more substantive you know, as the time goes on. When it comes to negotiating policy response, here there, there's actually quite little space, as I mentioned. Journalists try to push for negotiation through human interest stories. When it comes to Wen Chuan earthquake, there were quite a few human interest stories arguing that the survival of this earthquake is actually still an ongoing tragedy for many people. It hasn't passed. The life hasn't come back to normal. But they do it only through individual stories, not through collective kind of critique or mobilization against the local or the central state. So all of this improvisation, of course, is heavily guarded by the state. If you use the Sartre's metaphor of you know, tactical strategies, journalists resort to kind of tactically maneuvering the labyrinth of a city, but not changing the structures themselves of how the city is being built, right? So the city itself remains intact, despite the fact that they find different ways to maneuver it. And a very strong example of that is the Nanfang Zhongmo protest that I think many of you still remember from 2013, where journalists came out for the first time in years to protest censorship, and they garnered quite a bit of public support. Uh, essentially, there was a New Year editorial that was censored, and they stood up against it. And many Western outlets said that this is it. This is the revolution that we were waiting for. There's finally a movement against censorship in China. But it turned out to be not the case, right? The actual protest was quite localized. Uh, journalists came out and they negotiated also behind closed doors with local officials and quickly went back to work as usual and didn't quite dramatically you know, end up mobilizing other outlets to lobby on their behalf. So it turned out to be a very localized incident where they argued that their space is still beneficial to Chinese governance and that they better stay uh, sort of in the same uh, reasonable space of media critique in order to improve the system. They appealed to central state. They didn't try to critique the entirety of that structure. And that was the most dramatic example of resistance that we've recently seen uh, by Chinese journalists, the physical protest, not just the protest that takes place uh, in their writing. So just briefly to conclude with some thinking implications for thinking about China, Chinese studies. You know, the first thing here is that even though we think of the media largely in these dramatic forms of primarily propaganda or kind of dis dissent as being separate from uh, propaganda, what I find here is that supervision role or critique is really fused with propaganda. In order to survive as a critical journalist, you also have to promote some aspects of the state. You have to be somewhat hopeful, somewhat constructive. So essentially, there's a real kind of fusion between the supervision role and the propaganda function for these journalists where they can't always tell the two apart. Uh, and that's a very kind of opaque environment that they function in. 
and there isn't one clear-cut role of supervision or watchdog that we may find here in the US or in Europe. Uh, the other point here is about activism, that in the case of China, and I think also Russia and many other regimes that are not democratic, there's really quite a bit of importance placed on ambiguity. When the rules are not clear, there's more space to negotiate, to maneuver. Whereas when you make the rules very clear, usually it means there's just more restriction. And of course, Xi Jinping's era is a great example where there are more restrictions being placed on the media. There are more laws and regulations, which actually make it harder to improvise back and forth. So even though we think of transparency as the goal, in the case of uh, enduring uh, autocratic regime, it, the ambiguity actually can be quite empowering when it comes to sustaining that very limited space uh, within the system. And lastly here, it's the question of political governance. Uh, in some ways, I think this book questions the resilience paradigm that we've been so used to thinking about China as just surviving forever and it's very resilient and strong. What you see here is that the response is actually, again, very short term, very episodic when it comes to critiques. And then on the long term, it's, it's still very much unclear how much any societal concerns or critiques from the media are being taken on board to change policy making. So I'll stop here. I have a few more slides on Russia if anybody's interested in the comparison. If not, we can just discuss China. So I'll just end here and welcome your questions. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, I would uh, want to ask, uh, what is, how would you compare Russia's system mm -hmm. and China? But uh, one thing I conjecture I've had is that uh, uh, Putin has devised a system that depends less on censorship and more on a kind of targeted counter narrative. Mm -hmm. And actually, I think the most stunning example is actually occurring in the United States, mm -hmm. where uh, after discussion of uh, possible conspiracy mm. between the Trump mm. campaign and Russians, Sean Hannity came out saying the investigation of the conspiracy is the real conspiracy. Mm. And so uh, you don't have to censor if you can throw everybody into perplexity with uh, like what used to be uh, uh, called the big lie. Uh, that, so when Putin mm. says, uh, uh, we didn't shoot down the airliner over uh, uh, right. Ukraine and so on. So, um, so I'll take two more questions. The first one is about Russia and kind of the contrasting maybe approach, especially to global communication through conspiracy, sort of building and creating a counter narrative versus censorship. I think it's a great question. So any other questions? I'll take a couple more and respond together. I just wanted to also take up the comparative um, thread, but with the, the, the Who era and the Xi era. Mm -hmm. So obviously things have gotten a little bit tighter under yeah. Xi, but there was you know something of a... I don't know, a springtime for investigative journalism mm. during the, the early Who era. I was interested in your thoughts on like why you think that was allowed to happen and then why the party then cracked down on it again. Mm -hmm. That's a great question. Yes. Um, I wanted to ask, uh, in any society, journalists also play a role in informing the government. Right. And so to the extent that the government controls what journalists produce, it also kind of uh, inhibits what they actually get to understand and see. What I was wondering is, uh, do the journalists sort of, do journalists in China then sort of play a role in informing levels of government in the sense that some of their, what they produce isn't for public consumption? Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not sure if it's an old wives' tale, but that the Xinhua reporters, there are certain Xinhua reporters that sort of produce things internally for the government. So I was wondering if you could comment on that a sure. little. Okay, so I think I'll, I'll, uh, I'll start with those three because they're quite big. So the first one is on Russia. So I just wanted to show you um, a couple of slides, first about domestic media management and then maybe the external ones. So domestically, what I argue is that when you see the Russian case of critical journalism coexistence with the with the system is that it's much more tense and disconnected cohabitation, as I describe it. So what you see is that there are colliding objectives between journalists and the state. There is no unified vision of improving governance. In fact, as the state tolerates critics mainly for the purpose of image making. They try to project that Russia is a democracy, and they often argue that Russia is a democracy. They don't have another model that they're trying to promote as sovereign democracy, right? So it has a particular way in which they see their regime, and that if you want to be a democracy, you need to have a diversity of media voices. So when Putin is interviewed about censorship, about restrictions on human rights, he always or often points to the examples of diversity of news outlets. He says we have hundreds of hundreds of publications. And then he points to the critical ones because, in fact, in Russia, journalists can critique uh, quite a lot of aspects of the state that in China they're not allowed to do. So they, he always points to the fact that there is an image-making kind of notion. As one journalist from a very famous newspaper in Moscow, Nova Gazeta, referred to themselves as a vizitna kartichka, which means a business card for the, for the freedom of the regime. So he says we are always going to be existing because we are the business card. 
of kind of freedom. And it was, of course, very ironic, very cynical. He doesn't think that's a great thing necessarily, but that's how he presented their role as seen by the state. And when it comes to the critics, they really want to change the regime. Their idea of a sort of future freedom and even the future for Russia is that of a liberal democracy. They don't see themselves as contributing to some gradual evolution of the status quo. They're not happy with the status quo. And a large part of it, as I argue in some of my other work, is that the experience with democracy in Russia, right? The glasnost period, the opening up, the 90s, a very hectic, chaotic democracy where journalists had a big stake, which didn't go well for them, but they at least had a space to play around this real, real free media, which did not take place in China. They really hope for something bigger. So they're not satisfied with being agents of the state, with helping the state, with being some kind of a you know, assistants or consultants of the government. That's something that they not, don't feel satisfied with as their function. And when it comes to managing the, the media, there is indeed much less reliance or preemptive censorship. Uh, there's less of that in, 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 in Russia. There is no huge censorship apparatus the way it exists in China. But there's arbitrary coercion that sends signals to media communities. So for example, once in a while, someone is going to get arrested. And they'll go to jail for a very long time. Or there is a huge number rate of murders of journalists. Journalists actually get uh, murdered for their work. But it's not clear who murdered them. So there is no proof that it's the state. But the state doesn't stand up for media freedom in courts. You know, there's never a real sort of recollection or, or a sign that they're really um, having a fair trial or they found the right sort of um, uh, person who committed the crime. So essentially, there's kind of a condoning of violence uh, that's taking place. So there's no link to the state, but there's a condonance of violence. So I think there, there's a very different relationship that takes place between uh, journalists in Russia. But it's important to note that in terms of being listened to or having an effect, so to speak, Russian media has very small audience. Um, they're not seen as particularly influential. They largely speak to the same types of intellectuals who are already against the state. They kind of play on this dissident side, but they really have a very tiny marginal audience that still reads you know, these critical publications. It's very different, again, from, I think, the Chinese case. When it comes to conspiracy um, theory and finding the alternative narrative, I completely agree that the Russian approach to external image making, kind of combating uh, you know, accusations, is, is that of destruction. So you, combine, you find another narrative that destructs the enemy. It's kind of like you're, you're really in information warfare kind of uh, scenario. So you try to destruct the other. When it comes to China, I think it's a lot more constructive. Construct the story and try to present something that China stands for, or an image or a vision, however different or the same it might be to other countries. They try to construct some sort of a cohesive whole. When it comes to Russia, there's more of an attack on the other. Say, this is not true. We didn't do this. You did this. So it really becomes, like you said, a very incomprehensible system where facts are no longer facts, and nothing is really clear anymore. That's the kind of system they're trying to promote through their external propaganda, which they argue is working for them. They have a very high viewership on RT, on YouTube, and they're quite popular. So maybe this very destructive approach is actually serving them you know, some uh, success in terms of what they're trying to approach. But long term, maybe less so, because how long can you sustain that? That's not clear. So that's my um, response on Russia. On the second question about who she uh, comparison, sort of why was the media allowed to have any space in the first place? Why has it been um, shrinking or why has the space been shrinking? I think when it was allowed in the first place, there were several reasons. One of them was the economic impetus for opening up the media. It's too expensive to support everyone, all the media outlets, and subsidize them you know, indefinitely. So the economic impetus of commercializing the media, saying, hey, you guys can compete, you can advertise, you can own parts of the media, uh, was there. But then there was also governance impetus, that there are many so social issues that came around after the opening up reform, especially pollution, corruption, all sorts of grievances that the media was seen as potentially helpful to sort of highlight in a very moderate, very non-combatant form. But lately, why has it been shrinking? Again, there are two reasons, both economic and political. On the economic you know, domain, we see that the media, like everywhere else, print media is declining. The ad revenues are shrinking. There's this push for digitalization. So there's really kind of no space to grow as a traditional print media anymore. So that's a very competitive field, and only very few actors survive that battle. It's very hard to be popular digital media outlets in many, many places. Only one or two can survive that. So there's a competition there. But also the political reaction that's kind of more, a little bit more paranoid, a little bit more dismissive of critique, which perhaps is based on suspicion or maybe the inability to think of controlling mechanisms that will survive or suffice to manage that space. Uh, but in a way, it kind of, I think, prompts more critique and more dissatisfaction. I think when there was more space, there was also more collaboration. When there's less space, there's more dissent, more friction the way it is in Russia. So I see Russia's scenario is actually kind of the possibility for China if there is more and more tension and more collision between the officials and the, the critics that tend to actually support the status quo. That would be my answer to the third question. And then lastly, do journalists play a role in information kind of gathering for the state? Absolutely. They do the internal reporting. 
So Nathan, they produce reports that are channeled upwards. How many they produce, I don't know, because I wasn't focusing on that specifically in my research. But I know that many people I spoke to mentioned that they work on that. And they get to cover things that are quite interesting and sensitive, but nobody reads them except for very specific officials. Of course, the trouble with that, if it's too negative or too sensitive, they wouldn't like that report either. So it's kind of like you have to maneuver to see, would they like this? Would they accept it or not? And if not, it's not worth sending it upwards. So it creates kind of a skewed information um, function in a way. So. Hi. Hi. Thank you for coming. Sure. Uh, so you, I think we're talking mostly about domestic journalists and how they're treated by the, the state. But mm -hmm. I was just curious about how the state's treatment differs between domestic versus foreign journalists. And then if there's something uh, kind of different with you know, Hong Kong journalists, um, or if it's really more just a duality. Mm. Great. So in terms of uh, propaganda, can I say a mm. Russian, uh, Russian government's involvement is a less significant and systematic uh, compared to China, uh, uh, China's government? Is this your opinion, or are you asking uh, you me? Know, I, was, oh. I just, because, yeah, I, I'd like to know your comments. Whether well, Russian government's involvement is less systematic? Yeah. OK, when it comes to external propaganda. OK. Thank you, uh, thank you so much for your speech. Uh, my question is that, uh, from, from what you have said, mm -hmm. I, I think like the domestic journalism in China seems to help the central government to supervise some of the local corruption or maybe local problems. Is it one of their major roles? And is, is this kind of role that helping the central government is what required by the, the, the central government? Or I, I just want maybe you can elaborate on this role more, because maybe because like in the United States or maybe in many other uh, countries, this kind of role that kind of represents the collision between the central government and the local government is not quite mm -hmm. you know, obvious in other countries. Thank you. Great question. I'll, I'll just I'll answer these three. So the first one is about the treatment of foreign journalists and Hong Kong journalists versus domestic journalists. Um, I think there are some distinctions. I mean, first of all, Chinese journalists face much higher risks, you know, domestically operating in China. They're, the risks are simply much, much more extensive. I mean, you can lose your job, you can potentially be detained, um, you can lose your reputation, you can be blackmailed. I mean, you're a citizen of the country and you serve the country's interests to some extent. Foreign journalists, you might be denied visa. I mean, there's now increasing threats of detention as well, but I think for the most part, visa denials have been the mechanism of preempting foreign reporters from reporting very critical things or you know, accusing China of certain things or revealing certain things. So I think when the risks are actually much higher for domestic Chinese uh, professionals, which is often not accounted for in foreign media coverage of Chinese media. They sort of assume that they're just playing this you know, propaganda role because they don't know better. But many of these individuals are actually very well educated. Um, they spend time in top news outlets in the US, in Europe. They understand media ethics and professionalism, but they're not able to do more. So I think it's very important to recognize that they're not necessarily thinking in the terms in which they're acting. They have limitations, and uh, their risks are significantly higher. For Hong Kong, I think until recently it has been a space that's freer, but things are shifting as well uh, with the purchases, like you know the South China Morning Post by Alibaba. Like things are starting to shift, and it's not clear anymore. Is it that independent? So I think Hong Kong is on the brink, and you know there's a lot of debate as to how long it will remain uh, a safe haven for scholars and journalists, and uh, you know how long is that space for? For now, I think it still is. There's still a lot more critical you know coverage coming out of Hong Kong, but it's a very sensitive, very fragile space. So I wouldn't see it in a very long-term survival game yet. I think I see it as quite sensitive. That would be my response to the, um, the first question. And the second question on um, Russian involvement as being less systematic in propaganda, um, or less, I guess, maybe less extensive, maybe that's what you meant. Um, well, I think that when it comes to investing in, in image, in soft power, in sort of propaganda externally, China is definitely more invested um, when it comes to resources, when it comes to a real goal to compete in what they call you know, discourse power. You want to occupy discourse. You want to be actually at the top of that game. You don't want to be submerged to a Western narrative. So creating their own narrative, their vision, is something that's at the heart of this, this sort of soft power uh, reamping. Right? So much money is going into it. When you look at Russia, I don't see this effort to systematically transform a vision of Russia. I see an effort to combat uh, the alternative views, you know, very much um, kind of, again, very information war type uh, dynamic where you just simply oppose whatever the other says and try to find faults in their system. If you watch RT versus CGTN, you'll see that RT often critiques various aspects of the American system using American journalists. You know, they actually you know, co-opted and, and hired a lot of liberal-minded intellectuals who are unhappy with the status quo here, and they report for RT about the US. So it's very ironic, but it's, it's in perfect English. It looks like CNN sometimes. So you know, it, that's something that they're doing. Like, which one is more effective? I think it's questionable. Uh, when it comes to ratings and just viewership, it seems like RT is doing really well. But when it comes to long-term promotion of some idea of Russia in the world, it seems like it's not doing that well. Because when you ask them, what's the vision of Russia? 
I don't see much of a vision except that it's anti-Western, anti-hegemonic state, uh, which appeals to many other countries, but it doesn't create something that's really unifying beyond their position element. So that's how I would kind of respond to that. Um, and then you asked the question about the role of the media, local government supervision. Is it the role and how does it differ, I guess? Why is it like that and how does it differ from Western context? I would say yes, uh, it, it has been the role to supervise local level issues, but not only for the media, also for any kind of activists. Uh, the local issues are the ones that you're sort of allowed to, uh, at times, to delve into, not the central level. Uh, governance failures. And why is that the case? I think in some ways it's the nature of Chinese political system, you know, highly decentralized, which means that when it comes to governance, not everything can be seen by the center. And sometimes it's useful to showcase, to find out what's going on on the ground, and also to make central state appear as very responsive and very effective and very good, right? Very noble and moral. So if you have that kind of chance to showcase yourself as the fixer of the local issue, it's a good thing, right? It, it works well. But how long can it work for? That's also a question. Because eventually people start also linking local issues to central issues. It's not always so distinct, I think, in people's minds. So for now, it's been, a, I think it's been an intentional target to only look at local issues and highlight the role of the central state as very much efficient. But I think people start to sometimes merge the two together. You know, which one is local, which one is central, why is the local behaving this way? And how much of the fault is lying with the, with the higher officials? I think these questions may arise more often as the time goes on. Go. Hi, I'd like to know your comment on the government's pressure on the we media in China mm. and on the Sami state in the former Soviet Union. Mm. Thank you. So how the pressure is or yeah, on the we media? Can you say a little bit about ownership mm -hmm. of the media outlets and, of course, the fact also, I mean, one of the most striking differences between, let's say, the U.S. and China is how academics, if you want to launch a journal, you can just mm -hmm. register, right? In China, top universities have difficulty even establishing a journal or something of that nature, and most media outlets, you know, in terms of the ownership, mm -hmm. how do you see it? So how does ownership play into the relationship between yeah. the media and the state? Yeah. Good. Can you uh, elaborate a little bit about the digitization of media platforms in China, mm -hmm. especially in the form that a lot of the media channels are increasingly being owned by technology firms, the, some of the biggest technology mm -hmm. firms? Does that present like a clash between the newer media, more digitalized mm -hmm. media platform and the more older traditional uh, media platform like Xinhua Media? Mm -hmm. Is there any kind of like a clash in terms mm -hmm. of philosophy as well as the way that media is being done? Great question. Thank you. Um, so in terms of the, I think the pressures on we media, you meant social media, right? How the state uh, pressures the social media. Well, there, there are so many sophisticated uh, ways and toolkits that the state uh, deploys. I think it's just not just China, but many other governments as well to regulate social media. I think we want, the one we're most familiar with is content filtering, just simply filtering out sensitive uh, words, right? And prohibiting people from discussing them, kind of filtering out or banning the content altogether. Uh, but there's also the other side of it, which I've been researching recently, is about digital persuasion. So the contrast is not, it's not just about filtering or kind of negative words, but it's also about flooding information that's pro-regime, right, pro-state in a very creative way. So some of the pieces I've written were about the playful propaganda online, the kind of the idea of making, using gaming industry and so forth, and young people, young talent, attracting them to work for these so-called startup propaganda channels where they end up, you know, being paid really well and producing content that's much more fun. So for instance, if you retweet or share some of these stories, you Get like, you get to win something. There's a voucher you can win in Kindle. You can win some kind of a Apple ticket voucher or something of that sort. Something like very specific, but it makes it a little bit more fun, more entertaining. And the content also is more useful. Sometimes it's about how to get your kid into university or how to you know, get a train ticket for a summer vacation. So very specific kind of uh, needs that are being addressed while still talking about President Xi and talking about you know, his activities and the overarching ideology. So it's kind of much more fused, much less hard propaganda, but more playful, more gamed, more accessible to young people. So I think there's two things happening is increasing control through regulations, filtering, monitoring, you know, hiring more and more people to monitor social media for different bureaus, but also flooding with information that's you know, pro-state, positive, uh, inquisitive, fun, and trying to get people to sign up. Uh, to that and get points. So for example, there's Shui Sidago, like that app, right? There's been many stories about that. The more you click on it, the more you might get points to, I don't know, in your social credit ranking and so forth. So everything is being gamed, which I think is quite a motivating force, but it's also a little bit scary to think that every step you make on social media is ranked as something. It adds up to something uh, and it leads to certain outcomes for you individually as an economic agent or as an individual actor in China. So I think there's this gaming in, in sort of idea, the playfulness of it that's fused with ideologies actually much more powerful than solely filtering the words out. That's kind of my, my take on the, on the question. Does that answer? 
Or do you have a follow up? Yeah, follow up to the government's pressure on the on the Soviet state in, in oh, Soviet, in Soviet Union. Yeah. So I think that the big difference is that there was no internet. <laughs> so things were kind of both easier and harder. On the one hand, you simply couldn't filter things out. So what I remember from reading about this and also stories you know, from my parents who were, grew up in the Soviet Union is copying by hand you know, manuscripts. It's incredible copying all these long, long books by hand. It's just amazing. The effort it took to share you know, sensitive and controversial content through literature, through you know, articles, was, there was a lot more deliberation there. I mean, you have to take huge risks and huge physical manual effort to, to share these things. But it also meant that you might not be able to filter things as easily. Things were not as readily accessible online. So you have to really know who is copying the books to find them and to send them to the Gulag in the case of the Soviet Union. Right? So I think the, the control could not be as pervasive as it has been in China just because the tools are very different. But some is that also nurtured a group of intellectuals who ended up kind of becoming the key actors in the Glasnost era. A lot of them were actually the some is that generation. And when the things opened up in the Soviet Union, they took up sort of this mission of liberalizing the Soviet Union with you know, open arms and ended up marching forward to argue that we need free media, we need complete freedom. They were unsatisfied with this within the system idea, which Soviet Union also promoted. So once they were given the space, that same some is that generation ended up being the promoter of essentially the collapse of the Soviet Union. So that raises a lot of questions for how certain actors that you know I've been studying in China, how would they react to a situation when there is more space? Would they go along a more dramatic route? Would they take a more conservative route? Are they similar to the Soviet Samizdat generation or are they very different? I think that's something we cannot quite tease out yet, but I think there are questions there that are very interesting. Do you see any similar like, well, anyone playing any similar role in China? Some is that one. Well, there are people who are dissidents as well. I think most of them flee and remain outside of China, from what I observed. So I don't see them as, as, as much in China, but more in the United States and Europe, in other places where they can be more safe to play that role. Which is, again, another difference with Soviet Union. It was very hard to travel. It was very hard to leave. You, know, you cannot just leave. So leaving was almost impossible. Uh, everything was needed approval. Phone calls were impossible to, <laughs> to other places. Everything was extremely difficult. So even though China is also very complex, but I think the technology, the globalization of China, the interconnectedness with other countries makes it more accessible for people to come and go um, a little bit easier than in the case of the Soviet Union, which was really almost completely closed, I would say. So on the question of ownership and how that plays into the dynamics, I think, first of all, um, the ownership is still controlled by the state, obviously. So even if you have a 49% stake, the biggest decision maker is the party state. So you can never go outside of that um, space, where if you compare it with Russia, the ownership is actually private. Uh, it's owned by some very rich people, individual oligarch types who are against Putin. And they can kind of promote their vision, their agenda fully, without worrying about necessarily the financial means of how to sustain the media. They have their own investments in it. So in the case of China, this ownership model is very dependent on state allegiance. So I think the fascinating example is Peng Pai, where it's actually 100% owned by Shanghai authorities. And until I researched that more, I didn't realize that that's where all the money came from. It's completely state-owned. But it looks as if it's very slick and digital and commercialized, but it's not. So I think where we're moving with ownership is actually more state ownership, more complete ownership versus more privatization of the media space which raises certain questions. On the one hand, the state is very invested in creating these digital spaces where there's influence. On the other hand, it's more controlling. It's more capable of withdrawing capital if things go wrong. So I think we're actually shifting from saying, hey, you guys be independent, do your own thing, to more state-controlled uh, media sort of model, which hopes that some of these outlets will also be popular. I think that's where the tension is. It's very hard to be popular if you don't have good content, and most of them don't survive. So there's a very tricky kind of survival model for now, which is very much reliant on state funding. And I don't know how long they will proceed. Some people are already calling Pampai, what is it called, old leaves in a new bottle, or some sort of a metaphor that it's already kind of old. It's not exciting anymore. So how long these kind of outlets will manage to maintain their reputation before they're called propaganda or something of that sort, I think it's quite you know, questionable. So thank you for that, the ownership question. And uh, the last question was about clash of philosophies, right? These new digital spaces, like I guess you're referring maybe to Soho and like, Tencent and this different platforms that also have a media bureaus, so kind of media groups, versus like Xinhua or like state-owned media. Um, I mean, they have fundamentally different understandings of, thing, of the role of the media. Most of the ones uh, empowered by social media, they tend to do more in-depth and human interest stories. They're younger people. They're much more sort of liberal-minded. I think Xinhua is much more statist. But they also hire a lot of elites from top universities with top language skills. 
who are not necessarily journalists, but they have a lot of skills to promote Chinese vision to the world, so kind of writing in English for the global audience. But they do have quite different ideas of what the media role is. In the case of Xinhua, it really is mostly presenting the state's view, the party state's view. In the case of these digital platforms, there's more creativity, there's a bit more space to play around with it. And, and I think one of the spaces where they do play around is that many of them don't get journalist license, right? They don't have an official license to go out in the field, but they still show up and they cover stories. And the way they explain it to me is that the more they show up, the more people kind of respect them and say, hey, you're a real media, like I need to talk to you because you're influential. So they end up getting people to you know, accept interviews based on their image, their influence, not their official media card. So I think they really are pushing for some recognition despite the fact that they're not officially a news outlet, they're, they don't have that license. So that's a very interesting dynamic space that, again, how long it will last is unclear, but there are very, very smart people who are working in those outlets. What's the government's response to the new emerging way of media platform? Is it, do they have a long-term strategy? How do, do they plan to assimilate the new platform mm -hmm. into the more the older platform, or they, do they tend to treat them in a different way? Well, I think the model is actually to create their own digital platforms that are going to outcompete or succeed in that digital space. So going back to the question on ownership, you know, a lot of these new digital platforms are sponsored directly by the state, but they try to hide the state sort of role by changing names, making it more playful, creative. Nobody really knows until they dig into it that the state is sponsoring that platform. So I think their vision is to say, hey, we can do this better by hiring and poaching talent from other places and then making this a competitive space uh, of ideas, to, again, very limited, of course, but uh, to some extent. But still influential and therefore kind of continuing to influence public opinion. So a lot of remarks, I think, by higher officials is about the battlefield of the internet, which kind of indicates that the battle has not been won. There's still a lot of space to, you know, to fight, so to speak, for public opinion, for public voices. So I think they're trying to co-op the talent to create their own platforms, to sponsor their own platforms, and to make lo locals, local governments compete on that level. So after Peng Pai, there were dozens of other types of outlets that got set up as platforms, as, as apps, as you know, only on, online-only versions, as kind of modeling after Peng Pai. So there's a whole lot of competition that it spurred, and the government really you know, tried to make this a competitive space to create something that's state-owned, that's safe, but that's still exciting and fun. So I think that's the direction where they're going. Yeah. Sure. I think we have time for a final question, if there is one. Have a final question. Have you heard anything new about the speech share issue? Mm -hmm. uh, in, let's say Alibaba and so on. Uh, there has been some talk that mm -hmm. the state should be entitled at least to have some sort of legal share. Yeah, I mean, I haven't had uh, the news about how much share they're getting, but there's definitely a conversation about taking over some of these private spaces and kind of making the state at least play some role in them. So I think there's a concern with any of these sort of platforms, if they're solely on their own or whether it's a company, kind of going in the wrong direction. So there's a sort of sense that if you have some stake in any of those companies, you'll have a bit of control or maybe quite a bit of control, actually quite a lot of control in those developments. So I've heard you know, about the conversations and the debates, but I haven't seen new policies that definitively say how much stake and in what companies. But that's something I look forward to following. So. Thank you very much.